dendrites. This is a, a, the first talk, I think, about dendrites in the meeting, and I want to start with this slide, which I think highlights why we should care about dendrites. We start out with very simple, in terms of morphology, uh, neurons, right? You can see that the dendritic tree here is very simplified. And at the peak of our cognitive capabilities, that's when we have the maximum complexity in the dendritic structure. And this complexity decreases together with the loss of cognitive abilities. So it is highly likely that dendrites are contributing somehow uh, to, let's say, intelligence across species. And that's, for me, a very important reason for studying them. In addition to their complicated morphology, they support a large number of nonlinearities, which are important for understanding how they compute. For example, we can have different types of spikes, sodium-dependent spikes that are similar to action potentials that take place in different locations. Here, here you, wherever you see the blue, that's where we have sodium spikes in cortical neurons, so pretty much everywhere in this case. We also have calcium-dependent spikes that are more restricted in the uh, apical tuft, uh, very close to the terminal dendrite of these neurons. And we can have NMDA spikes, which are typical for this plateau, and they can be found mostly in the terminal dendrites, at least according to this nice review paper by Nelson Spruston and Craig Stewart. So we have all these different types of dendritic spiking mechanisms occurring at different locations within dendrites, and the question is, what are they good for? Yeah, sorry. What are they good for? What do they allow the neuron and the circuit to compute? So we want to understand in my lab, essentially, what are the type of computations that we can do with dendrites. The first one that has already been mentioned by many before me is what we call signal amplification. So if you deliver two isolated synaptic inputs into one dendrite in a cortical neuron, this is work from the Chiller lab, if you activate them individually, you get a small subthreshold response. But if you activate them together, you get a big uh, dendritic spike event, which is highly supralinear. And therefore, this is a mechanism to induce amplification of signals. It's very similar to what Janet was talking just before me about combining uh, two inputs that give rise to a plateau potential. So that's one type of computation. This property can be exploded to do more. For example, this amplificating signal, the dendritic spike, in these neurons depends on the timing of the two inputs. So only if both inputs are activated together, you get a very strong nonlinear response. If you separate them in time, then you lose this amplification. And this feature can be used to tell the neuron that you are now receiving coincident input. So that's another type of computation that can be supported by dendrites. Uh, many years back, together with Bartlett Mel, we also uh, showed using computational modeling that these dendritic nonlinearities can be exploited by neurons to perform both sublinear and supralinear integration, depending on the location of the inputs. So if you put the same synaptic input into the same dendrite, because of the generation of these dendritic spikes, you get a nonlinear integration, supralinear integration. If you separate the same inputs across different dendrites and you look at the cell body, then what you get is just linear summation. So the dendritic nonlinearities allow neurons to implement sigmoidal, if you like, uh, integration, which can vary in, in the extent, depending on the location and the strength of the input. This was a prediction generated by computational modeling, which was soon verified experimentally in other labs, a lab of Jackie Chiller and uh, uh, Jeff McGee um, many, uh, a few years later. So these are just a few examples of the type of computational properties that neurons have because of their nonlinear dendrites. Recently, we extended this work to look at interneurons. So we typically think of interneurons as just summing devices, but they also have complex dendrites. And the question was, can these cells also perform this fancier type of computations? So using compartmental biophysical modeling, which uh, Michele before me and Jeanette also uh, introduced, we built models of fast spiking basket cells and asked the same question. How do their dendrites integrate signals? So we found in these neurons two types of computations, if you like. Some of the dendrites were capable of generating the dendritic spikes, leading to these nonlinear integrative responses that we see in pyramidal neurons. 
But other dendrites did not have this capability. They were not able to induce the direct spikes, at least within the physiological synaptic regime that we know about these cells. And they implement this purely sublinear integration. Interestingly, a few months later, we received support for such a dual integration in interneurons. From the lab of the Dredi Kulmar, there comes this nice paper where they found in PV neurons, interneurons, not exactly, not necessarily basket cells, but PV interneurons, two types of integration, one that is almost linear and one that is sublinear. It, suggesting that we should also consider the dendrite of interneurons and the kind of computations that maybe they support and how these add up to the complex view of the dritic uh, and neuronal um, computations. Okay, so dendrites are nonlinear, so what? How does this impact a brain? What is the advantage of having these nonlinearities? Well, it is important because if you have these sigmoidal integrative units sitting within a neuron, and you have many of them, this must mean something about what these neurons can compute, right? Are they endowing these neurons with advanced uh, computing capabilities? So many years back to answer this question, we took our biophysical models and assigned these nonlinearities in each one of their dendrites pretty much building a simplified mathematical model, a two-layer artificial neural network. And we ask, can we describe with this simple mathematical model the firing rate of a detailed computational neuron? And the answer was yes. We could generate a lot of inputs to these detailed neurons and use a mathematical abstraction to predict the, the output. And we could do this with a, with a very high accuracy. So with a correlation coefficient which is very close to one, let's say. This was for pyramidal neurons. Very recently, we repeated the same exercise for the interneurons, which I just showed you before. So we put these mathematical abstractions with two types of dendrites now, both the supralinear and the sublinear ones, and we trained this mathematical model to predict the mean firing rate of the interneuron. And we compare the performance of this model to a linear uh, point neuron, if you like. And we've shown that you can do a much better job fitting the output of an interneuron with a two-layer artificial neural network. This means that our models essentially suggest that neurons act as small networks, and they could, in fact, be much bigger than two layers, which is what we claim here. Others have found three layers, and recently the Segev lab, lab claimed that uh, a cortical neuron needs a seven-layer uh, deep neural network to describe its actual uh, firing rate. So essentially, dendrites provide these single neurons with advanced computing capabilities because they allow these small isolated structures to perform nonlinear integration. That's the take home message, if you like. So this is a talk about uh, the Human Brain Project. So what we wanted to find out next is whether human dendrites are smarter, are, uh, you know, they have some additional cognitive capabilities, cognitive, you know, advanced computing capabilities. So for this work, we've teamed up with Matthew Larkum, and he's, uh, you know, better to explain this work than I am, but I will give it a try. And uh, uh, together with Albert Guidon, who's a very talented uh, postdoctoral fellow in Matthew's lab, uh, Albert looked at brain slices from human neurons, and he recorded in their dendrites to see how they integrate signals. And what Albert found was a new type of a dendritic spike called the dendritic calcium action potential, which you can see here. And among its other interesting properties, this dendritic spike has a very unique feature. As you increase the stimulation intensity by injecting current into the dendrite, the amplitude of these dendritic spikes becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. This is a feature that was not seen in other types of dendritic spikes, like in sodium spikes, for example, where you typically have the same amplitude as you increase the stimulation intensity. If you want to describe this property mathematically, what you need is a transfer function which is non-monotonic. It means that if you have a very low amount of current, these spikes are not induced at all. For the ideal amount of current, you have the maximum amplitude, which would be here, for example. And as you inject more and more current, then the amplitude becomes smaller and smaller. So this non-monotonic transfer function is interesting because it could be solving a different type of computation than the one we've seen before, like the amplification or the coincidence detection. So what could it be that this transfer function would solve? What kind of problems would it solve? 
So we thought of a nonlinear problem called the exclusive OR problem. You can think of the exclusive OR as a gate, a logical gate, where you have two pathways arriving, pathway A and B. If none of these pathways, which could be synaptic input, if none of them arrives and the gate is, is closed, which means these direct spikes are not generated at all, if either of the two synaptic pathways is activated, you have the ideal response here. But if both of them are activated, then you have a very weak response because now you take advantage of this dropping amplitude. So we tested this hypothesis using biophysical computational models of layer two, three uh, pyramidal neurons uh, um, based on the experimental data collected in Matthew's lab. And we simulated synaptic input, which we could not do in slides in the experiment. It was very difficult to do it. So we simulated these two synaptic pathways. And this is a work of Nasi Papuzzi, a brilliant uh, um, uh, researcher in the lab. So Nasi created a model of this drop in amplitude of the dendritic calcium action potentials and put these uh, properties into a biophysical model to see whether we can solve this problem. So we gave into these neurons input in the form of two synaptic pathways, X and Y, together with some background excitation and some inhibitory synapses, and asked, can we solve this exclusive or problem? So if you activate just one pathway, then you get a strong response in the dendrite and a strong response in the soma because you're driving the maximum dendritic depolarization, the maximum dendritic response, not the maximum depolarization. It is sitting within the optimal range. And this happens with both synaptic inputs. But if you now activate them together, because the net depolarization is much higher, you are in this regime now, the response in the dendrite is very small, and similarly, the response in the soma is much smaller. So these uh, simulations already suggest that by having these types of dendritic spikes, you can solve the exclusive OR problem. What is even more interesting is the effect of inhibition. Depending on where you place inhibition, it can have a different role. If inhibition is located within the same dendrite where these spikes occur, because it reduces the net depolarization, it brings back the dendrite into the regime of maximum responses. And therefore, you get a strong dendritic response and a strong somatic response. In other words, inhibition acts as excitation. But if now you place inhibition elsewhere, closer to the cell body, for example, then the dendritic response uh, can be restored to some extent, but the somatic one is suppressed. So inhibition acts as its classical role as inhibitory drive. And the take home message from this work that was, was that essentially a human dendrite uh, can solve a nonlinear problem, which is the exclusive or problem, uh, by just using a small compartment. Of course, this is, this is not really new, right? These kind of logical operations are known to be solved by dendrites many years back in, in the 80s. But at that time, you needed more than one compartment. So the main interesting contribution of this work is now you can do it with a, just a chunk of a dendrite. And if there are any students in the audience that may be interested to hear more about it, there was a nice, um, which doesn't play, a nice video by the Quanta magazine, which you can search and find in the internet about this work um, that explains it in a really nice manner. It can be tempting to think. We don't have time to go that, and that's too loud. <laughs> <laughs> so, OK, so that's all published. So the next step was to look at what about other logical operations? We have this type of dendritic spike, which is doing something smart. Is it capable of solving more than one problems? To answer this question, we took a slightly different approach where we used a mathematical abstraction now where you have a, a small node of an artificial neural network, if you like, which receives two binary inputs uh, and a bias and the, passes the end result to this transfer function that we have seen that exists in human dendrites. And we look at the output. Can we solve multiple logical problems using this simplified transfer function, if you like? So we look, for example, at the exclusive or problem. This is a mathematical approach, as I said, not the same as a biophysical model. So we have this, uh, the transfer function here, and we looked for different weights, so the, the space of solutions in our mathematical model that could provide a response that is within the active range of the dendritic spikes. 
So we saw that you can find a lot of ways that solve this problem as claimed by our computational uh, detail model as well. And you can do this, the interesting part is using both excitatory and inhibitory inputs. And just to take you through this solution, you can imagine that you have one input that is excitatory and it takes you to the peak of this transfer function. Another one that is a little bit bigger, but it's still within the active range of this transfer function. But their addition will take you out. It goes out of the active range. And that's how you solve this problem. And this is true for other uh, nonlinear uh, uh, logical functions, like the XNOR, which you can solve with one excitatory and one inhibitory input in this case. And this is also true for other logical functions, like NOR, which you can solve with many combinations of excitatory and inhibitory inputs. And just to cut a long story, sto long story short, essentially what we found with this mathematical approach is that we can solve all Boolean functions this way, with a single transfer function based on the dendritic activation of human neurons. And you can do this in a regime that varies greatly. For example, in this case, uh, in the F12 logical function, there's a very small solution space. But in others, like F5, for example, there's a big solution spa space. What is even more interesting is the dependence of these solutions on the bias. The bias is just an additive term that shifts the location of the input relative to the activation of the transfer function. So you can push it before or after. And you can solve all of these Boolean functions in different combinations depending on this single bias <coughs> value. So for a small bias value, you can solve all the colors that you can see here. With an intermediate bias, which is in the center of the activation function, you have another set of solution. And with a bigger bias, you have another set of solution. Why is this interesting? It's interesting because we think of this bias as signaling the state of the animal, if you like. So if you have a high conductance state, for example, you would be here. So you have a, a very strong activity in the neuron already. A low conductance state would be here, a very weak activity. And therefore, this. Uh, transfer function or this property of the, of the human dendrites allows a single neuron, if you like, to solve different combination of problems depending on this state, depending on the input that comes as a background. So we think that's interesting and uh, you know, I hope you agree. Uh, so how different is this set of solutions provided by the dendritic action potentials in human neurons compared to a classical sigmoidal function, which is what we've seen extensively in animals. So you can still solve all these combinations, not all of them. So you can see the colors here. It's not all 13 of them. Uh, depending, again, on the bias value below or after the threshold, but you have a much smaller solution space in this case. So essentially, the, having this type of dendritic spikes described, by, uh, described in human neurons allows a model neuron to have a much higher computational capacity by solving many more of these logical operations. That's a take home message. Um, how much time do I have? Because I want to say. Three minutes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on. Okay. I will, I will, I will skip this. We have more time because of the other talks. Ah, okay. Because I wanted to tell you a small story about uh, circuit computations and how these properties of dendrites can contribute to circuit learning. Okay. I'll try to go fast. Um, so this is a work that was done with Alcino Silva in collaboration with Alcino Silva, and it's about linking memories across time. So this is, let's say, closer to our cognitive capabilities because it is a difficult problem. And the question is, do these dendritic nonlinearities contribute uh, some, uh, something to this uh, more difficult cognitive function? So Alcino had a theory many years back that if uh, you experience two memories in close temporal proximity, so within just a few hours, these memories will be linked. And they will be linked because they will be stored in the same population of neurons. He tested this hypothesis with the help of Denise Kai, a brilliant postdoctoral fellow in his lab that now has her own lab in New York. And Denise put animals in different contexts separated by either seven days of five hours and look at their interaction. 
So she found that if you separate these uh, two memories with, by just five hours, then the animals will freeze in both contexts, although they were only shocked in one of them, showing that the animals associated these two different locations because they were experienced in very short time intervals. If you separated them by seven hours, then this behavior, this leaking behavior was not, uh, was not in place. And she also observed that this was correlated with a much higher overlap in the population of neurons that encoded the two memories when they were close in time versus separated across uh, several days. So we, we team, uh, teamed up with Alcino to use the computational model to try to figure out what is the mechanism behind this linking. So we generated this uh, large, large, it's only 500 neurons, this small microcircuit model, which we furnished with uh, nonlinear dendrites in the pyramidal neurons and the interneurons, and we train it to form an associative memory. An associative memory in this network is essentially formed after learning, and we have four types of plasticity rules in this model to allow this learning, classical LTP and LTD, homeostatic plasticity, plasticity of intrinsic excitability at the cell body and rewiring. So we have these four types of plasticity rules in the network. We present the two contexts where we'll let the plasticity rules operate and read out afterwards the overlap at the population of neurons. This is the model uh, learning the memory and we skip to the results because we don't have time. And what we found is that very, very similar to the experimental data, if you separate these two memories by five hours versus 24 hours, for example, here, there is a significant overlap in the population of neurons, which you can see here, for different configurations. And this overlap is very similar to the experimental data, so near uh, 20%. And this overlap disappears if you eliminate the increase in intrinsic excitability. That was uh, what uh, uh, Alcino thought would be the, the main mechanism. So we reproduced the experimental data on the neuronal level, but also predicted that at the dendritic level, this linking would happen by organizing inputs from both memories into common dendrites, forming synaptic clusters. So the prediction of the model was that if you link memories across time, this is because they co-cluster with common dendrites. And we now went on to test this hypothesis experimentally with Alcino together, so to test whether indeed the dendritic clustering would be the mechanism underlying memory linking. And Alcino is doing this via a set of very elaborate and complicated experiments, so I will go, I, I am not in a position to explain them, I will just give you the highlights. He's looking, uh, she's looking, Meg actually, a brilliant postdoctor, um, PhD student. She's looking into the retrosplenar cortex. She's using a very fancy tagging technique which can tag only uh, dendrites. So she's looking at whether the dendritic sections, which are imaged here, are overlapping between uh, context experience at five hours versus seven days apart. And she finds that indeed at five hours, there's a very significant increase in the common dendrites that encode these two memories. And this overlap is very small if they're separated across seven days. Uh, she also looks at synapse clustering within these dendrites, and she found that whenever you have uh, plasticity within one dendrite, then the probability of having new uh, synapses added to that dendrite, so contributing to clustering, is much higher if these dendrites are involved in both contexts versus just one. So she's looking at essentially the number of spines that are added into common dendrites. And this is much higher in five hours versus seven days, which you can see here. So there's also evidence of increased clustering in the dendrites in these experiments. So, so, the, so this data essentially support the modeling idea that there is when you have a memory linking, this is likely to be because of increased clustering in the dendrites. And she also tested whether this would be sufficient to, let, to link the two memories by optogenetically activating the animals into their uh, <laughs> home cages at a time at which they should not be doing any linking. So she's shining light onto the brains of these animals when they're sitting in their home cages and looking at whether they uh, uh, have a linking of memories um, over the next few days. 
And she finds that if you do this manipulation, you induce linking, which you do not see in control animals. So finally, um, what we did together using our model is to try to understand what could be the mechanism that underlying this linking in, at the dendrite level. So we simulated, we added a new plasticity mechanism that now uh, simulates increases in the excitability of dendrites, and not only at the cell body, as we've done in our previous models, versus the previous model, which did not have these dendritic excitability changes, to see whether this is needed to explain uh, MEGAS data. And what we found essentially is that we can reproduce all of the properties of neuronal overlap, of the dritic overlap compared to the experiments, and of clustering compared to the experiments with both models, or, although without the dritic excitability, this overlap was significantly reduced, but we could still get overlap in all of the cases. What could not, what could not be reproduced, however, was the stability of this event. So if you did not have the dritic overlaps here, the next day when you record the memory, the model predicts that there will be no association at all. So there is a need for the dritic mechanisms also to explain this linking across time. Okay, so that was too much information, I apologize. <laughs> the take home message was that I hope I convinced you that dendrites uh, are important. They are important because they increase the key computing capabilities of individual neurons, both in humans and in mice. The human dendrites may have more advanced computation probabilities, uh, properties because of these uh, spikes, although these dendritic spikes, I should say, similar to these dendritic spikes, have recently been reported in rats uh, in CA3 neurons, uh, the work done by uh, Judith Makara. Um, that the dritic mechanisms underlie the linking of memories across time through facilitating the synapse clustering within the same dendrites, and that this plasticity of dendrites may be necessary and sufficient for allowing the linking of memories across time. How does this all relate to consciousness? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but it shows that uh, dendrites might be an important substrate to study for understanding uh, the dritic neuronal and circuit computations. And I would like to thank the members of my lab for their uh, really important work here and their funders for supporting our research and you for your attention.